Lord, I am, God, again, thankful, Lord, to come in and, and be involved, Lord, in your word. I'm asking you, Lord, tonight, let there be insight, let there be revelation. And I know, Lord, that you do have the ability, God, to let there be stability, Lord, in our lives spiritually. At the same time, God, let there be a, a soberness, God, about us that when we're aware, Lord, that we are facing a, a real enemy. And yet, God, you have, you have supplied, Lord, all authority to be able to help us. I pray, Lord, tonight, God, help us to always to know that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so we are going to start in uh, chapter 20. And uh, it's there uh, talking about this matter of uh, Satan uh, and demons. And uh, <clears throat> again, apologize for the... Um, lack of a PowerPoint because I did have a pretty <clears throat> good amount of extra additional information on the PowerPoint that was not necessarily in the in the book and uh, but we'll try to get to that maybe uh, next time around um, <clears throat> so first of all let's just talk about this matter and uh, it's, it is right there in your in your uh, uh, Grudem's deal where it opens up. Now, I, I've got the my old copy because it's marked up, highlighted, all that sort of stuff. So I, I think yours probably uh, closely correlates to that. But let's talk about this matter, uh, about what a definition, uh, first of all, of a demon uh, really is. And demons are evil angels that sinned against God. And they now continually work evil in this world. Now, this is not a, a uh, necessarily a new thought. Uh, in fact, I think as our society has gotten more secular, uh, now it kind of just looks at this matter uh, as a uh, novelty. It's a horror sort of deal uh, that people kind of just out of curiosity, Stephen King, horror novels, uh, horror movies, things like that. Uh, I can remember whenever I was a kid, uh, The Exorcist came out and it was quite a stirring uh, for people that were in and around the church. Of course, um, I've never seen The Exorcist. I don't know if I even had the opportunity to, to see it. I certainly would not uh, be curious about that. But uh, Hollywood is very much in a, a manner, and I think part of that is a matter of deception. What they want to do is they want to deceive people uh, and make them think that it's less than really what it is. And uh, up until probably, um, I would say, the 19th century, we start getting into the age of quote-unquote enlightenment or rationalization, and people start kind of scoffing uh, at the devil and they think he's a little guy that's in a little red suit, got a few little pointy horns and a pointy tail and a pitchfork. And, uh, and so we bought in to that idea. Uh, C.S. Lewis uh, said that basically what, what the devil wants us to do is to be extremely overly curious about him or to ignore him completely and totally. And I think there's probably some, some, some wisdom in that. Uh, we're not going to get into the uh, demon slayers or demon hunters and all that stuff that some of the, if you get on YouTube and start looking around at, I'm sorry to say, uh, charismatic or Pentecostal uh, sorts, you've got a lot of that that's going on these days, a lot of debate about whether or not that a Christian can be demon possessed. And uh, we'll get into some of that probably in the next lesson. I'll just tell you straight up, no, they cannot be demon-possessed. 
Uh, but the charismatic world really likes to play into that idea uh, to say, hey, you know, a Christian can be demon possessed, but that's not scripturally accurate. And we will walk through that. And uh, so we'll get to some of that during the next time around. Uh, but when you look at, at our society, we do want to kind of just dismiss uh, the matter of, of um, demons and, and certainly what they are. They are fallen angels. Um, Sunday, um, I, was, I was, in fact, I was working on some of the material for, for tonight. I was working on it Sunday afternoon. And um, I listen to Apple Music. I've just got a lot of playlists uh, that I have that, that I listen to sometimes while I'm studying. And so I turned on my Apple Music. Well, it's on the screen there in, in, in my uh, study. And um, Taylor Swift popped up. Well, to be honest with you, I vaguely knew who she was. Didn't know much about her until she started catting around with the... Uh, football player here a year or so ago but I didn't know it but she dropped a album on last Friday I think it was April the 19th uh, that she dropped an album so when when Apple Music pops up there's a video that comes up and lo and behold here is Taylor Swift and uh, just out of curiosity uh, four and a half minute four minute and fifty seconds maybe uh, there was a video. The title of the video was called Fortnite. And um, I can't remember the title of the uh, work. It's, um, it's not the Dead Poet Society, but it's the Tortured Poets something or other uh, like that. And so I clicked on that video and um, I have to admit that Taylor Swift did not look uh, trashy like uh, Madonna. Uh, did back in the 80s. That's when I was in high school. And uh, that was kind of the appeal back then. The devil music was uh, Black Sabbath and ACDC and, and uh, all that stuff that go, kind of goes in that category. And of course, we were all, you know, we, we didn't listen to that stuff. But what I noticed was there was a lot of symbolism that was in that video. And she was dressed all in white. However, her eyeliner... Uh, all of her makeup, lipstick, uh, fingernail polish was all black. And uh, she, she comes over to this mirror and it's got a sink. She wets, I guess, wets a washcloth and starts wiping her face. And when she starts wiping her face, these, these black tattoos are totally, no, well, not totally covering her face, but the symbolism that is there. And, um, and she's tagged into a lot of teenage young girls. Uh, I do know that her last um, tour that she did, there was a concert down in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And she basically was, uh, the, the platform uh, was very much set up like a witch's coven. And uh, they were boiling a pot of whatever. But again, here is the part when you're seeing that. It's, it's not crazy like it was back in the, in the 80s. Now, it's wooing people in. And I sit there and I watch that. I watch it through the whole, whole deal. And I thought to myself, okay, here is the, the attack of the devil and it's not scary. It's not, you know, it's a seducing spirit. That's what it is. And so there's very much an awareness um, of what society that we're living in uh, these days. And I just believe that there should be more than ever a greater call for holiness and righteousness and separation from the world. And so when you look <clears throat> the definition that, that Grudem uh, has given, demons are evil angels who sinned against God and who now continually work evil uh, in the world. Now last week I did mention, uh, or last time around, I did mention John Milton's Paradise Lost. Uh, it's similar in, and not as popular as, um, as Pilgrim's Progress, 
Uh, but John Milton, if you get on the internet, you can see there was an artist by the name of Gustave Doré. And he did a lot of what was called woodcuts. And he illustrated uh, Milton's um, the uh, book where it was Paradise Lost and it talks about the fall of man. And he goes through Genesis 3 and starts working through all of that and, and the pictures that he drew back in, I think it was in maybe the 1800s or so, something like that, are so good that, that you really, uh, the guy was very gifted whenever he was drawing those pictures. And I had some of them that I was, uh, was going to put up on the uh, deal here uh, tonight. But when you start looking uh, at what took place, I want you to open your Bibles up to Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to talk about where that um, all of this started. And so in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31... Uh, scripture gives a description of what took place after uh, the creation. I do believe they were, those were six 24-hour days. I don't believe they were a thousand year, though one day is as a thousand years. Some people believe that, that one day of creation was a thousand years. I believe they were, those were 24-hour days that God created uh, the world. But look at, at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31. The Bible says there, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And then I want you to look over at Genesis chapter 3 and look at verse 1. The Bible says there, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So here's what I want you to know. That somewhere between Genesis 1 and 31 and Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, there was a rebellion that took place in heaven. There was the fall. That's where that something took place and it had all of a sudden now, it separates and now we have evil that is present and, and you have the appearance of this uh, arch enemy. But always keep this in mind. The devil is not equal with the Lord. Uh, the devil is a created being, and uh, we'll get into some of that as, as, we, uh, as we unfold uh, the lesson here. But whenever that rebellion took place in heaven, there are some scriptures that kind of point to that, and I want to read a couple of those. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2, and I want you to look uh, in verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. Uh, here uh, again, and we're going back to, be, to the beginning uh, very early uh, when all of this began. But, but in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, the Bible says, Therefore, if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Now, I want you to turn over a page, and I want you to look at Jude. I say a page, turn over a few pages. I want you to look to Jude and look in verse 6. That's almost a... Almost a exact replay of what we read about in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. But the Bible says there in Jude 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Now Peter, whenever he wrote 2 Peter, and Jude, whenever Jude wrote his epistle, both of those were written very closely together. 
And, and both of them deal specifically 2 Peter chapter 2 and the book of Jude very much mirror each other uh, when you look at that. But what took place? What, what caused the Lord to say, we're going to deal with these, um, these the enemies that have developed? Well, I believe part of that answer can be found in Isaiah chapter 14. And this is where, again, what we're talking about is we're talking about uh, a rebellion that took place in heaven. But look in Isaiah chapter 4, or 14 rather, and I want us to begin uh, in verse 12. Isaiah chapter 14 and beginning in verse 12. Here is what Isaiah writes to us again. Okay, now you've got that. It's it's got it's right there in your uh, your text there. Uh, but but let's look at at what it says. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend unto heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Now, if you mark in your Bibles, there are five I wills that you find right here in this scripture. Now, what I did was I underlined those five I wills. At the root of that is something called pride. That's really is what is motivating because when you look, look at what he says. He says, starting in verse 13, I will ascend. Then he says, I will exalt. And then he says, I will sit also. And then he says, I will ascend above and then lastly, he says, I will be like the Most High. Now, when he says, I will be like the Most High, does that prompt anything in your memory from Genesis chapter 3? You remember what he, he lied, the serpent lied to Eve. What, was he, what, was, what did he say to her? You'll be like God. That's, that's the whole goal. So, so this part that you see right here is in, in um, Isaiah 14, the very last thing. There is that craving and desire in, uh, in Lucifer's heart that he says, hey, he said, I am going to be like God. Now, let's move it down to mankind. What is it that motivates Man to get into the trap of sin. He desires to be God. He wants to be the God of his life. He wants to be in control, in charge. So what causes him to move into that is that he gets involved with the matter of pride. Now there's another scripture that I want to point uh, out to you and that is over a little bit, a few pages over. Look at Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel was another one of the prophets. Uh, he is considered one of the major prophets because of the length of his book. But look in Isaiah or Ezekiel rather, chapter 28, and I want you to uh, look in verse 11. Here is what Ezekiel writes in Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 11. So we've got a snapshot in Isaiah 14 of what Lucifer looks like. Now, Ezekiel's going to come around and he's going to give us a little, bit, a little bit different view. So what we're doing is we're kind of looking at this thing. It's about like getting a CAT scan. And the CAT scan, you go in there and it kind of slices you up like, a, 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 you know, like they cut ham. And what you can do is you can see it from different angles 
And now it's digital. It's not on, on film like it used to be. And what you can do with a computer screen now is you can rotate and turn that thing around. If you want to look at the liver, you can isolate the liver and pull it out, take a look at that, and you can turn it around and twist it around and look at it in all different directions. That's what we're doing. And that's why cross-referencing is important whenever you look at what Scripture has to say. So look at verse 11. It says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son, of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealedest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now, before I go any further, you say, Well, this is talking about a man. This is talking about the king of Tyrus. And that is true. But keep in mind that when you look at Scripture, that there are times where that God uses earthly men to present to us a spiritual picture. He's going to do that with the Antichrist. The Antichrist will be a literal embodied person, but that Antichrist is going to be Satan incarnate. Really, it's what, it's what it boils down to. So what Ezekiel is doing is Ezekiel is saying, okay, we're going to look at this king, and yet as we read this, here's what you're going to find out, is that there are things that unfold there. They're kind of like clues that you're looking at, and it's going to give us a picture of what the devil looks like. He says, thou has been, verse 13, thou has been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the, bur the burl, the onyx, and the jasper, and the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art an anointed cherub that covereth. Now, is that the king of Tyre? No. He wasn't, he wasn't an angel. So now, you see what's taking place? Ezekiel is seeing something that is spiritual. So here's what he says. He says, when I look at this king of Cyrus, or king of Tyre, he said, verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. The stones of fire ring a bell with anybody? Anybody? Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm looking for a more modern reference. Revelation? Coals of, fire. Coals of fire. Anybody ever heard of Harry Potter? J.K. Rowling? Okay, well, you see right here some of, some of the part where she kind of weaves it into her writings. Okay? Now, I hadn't read... Um, I have, 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 in fact, I haven't read any of them. I, I thought about reading them just out of curiosity because it was, it was really, when it come out, it was the rage. Uh, I mean, kids were reading that stuff like crazy. And what was happening is all through that was a mixture of wizardry, a mixture, mixture of witchcraft. And, and, and again, this is a the part. They don't want us to believe in God, but they want us to believe in demons. They, they don't want you to believe in angels but they do want you to believe in witches and witchcraft and all that. And so when J.K. Rowling writes all of the Harry Potter stories and it's the rage, then what happens is, is our kids are reading that. And that came out, I was still working at the hospital. I remember uh, some of the physicians that I worked with, man, they were so excited because their kids were reading books. And then very closely after that, another woman comes along, and her name is Stephanie Meyer, and she writes the Twilight series. What's the Twilight series about? It's about vampires. I think they even turned it into a movie. And and you've got these vampires, and this vampire is... is 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 working with this young woman i'm guessing because i remember seeing the the pictures on the books uh, that's when i don't know if y'all remember you remember me i was preaching one time and i really wasn't preaching i was meddling 
And I, I told everybody that they ought to go to Barnes and Noble and go back and look in the uh, young adult section and look at the covers of the books and just look at how dark. And every it, it was all all the covers were black. And so Stephanie Meyer comes along and she writes about vampires and all that sort of thing. So again, here's what we're doing. We're seeing this biblical image. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a fable. It's not a myth or a legend. Ezekiel is seeing something. Now, you remember Sunday morning whenever I was teaching, you said, if you've got a Thompson chain reference, when was that? And we'll look out to the side of there, chapter 29, 589 B.C. So six centuries, 2,600 years ago, this prophet is seeing a world that is full of demonic spirits. Okay, so we keep on. He says in verse 15, Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Now notice this. Here's what we do. We pick out another clue is that you realize that the devil was a created being. Okay? So he's created there in verse 15. Verse 16, By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee out as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. All right, so here's what takes place. Let's go back for a second. Uh, look, look at verse 17. See there where it says, I will cast thee to the ground. And I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Do you remember Jesus saying anything about the devil? What's that? Okay. That is one of the deals, but do you remember? I saw Satan cast down as what? As lightning. Okay, so the devil is cast out of heaven as lightning. So now, let's go back and let's think. Genesis one thirty one to Genesis three one. So what take what took place was during that rebellion is the Lord cast Satan out of heaven. Okay, does that make sense? Everybody following along? So when you start looking and you're pulling biblically from various different directions, what happens or what takes place is again, we're getting a clear picture of what's taking place uh, with, with the devil. Okay, now um, I uh, turn over and get to the part where... Uh, that it says, it's right up under that verse reference, Ezekiel 28, 11, uh, through verse 19. Um, and he says, um, let's turn, let's turn, you see where he says, however it's unlikely that Genesis chapter 6, verses 2 through 4 refers to the fall of demons. Uh, in those verses, we are told the sons of God saw the daughters of men were fair and took to wife such of them as they choose. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Now, 
Here's the part uh, where that if you mark in your books like these kinds of books, these systematic theology books, I always generally when I'm reading kind of these theology books, if there's something that I disagree with, then what I will do is I will write down in red that I disagree uh, with this section, okay? And so I do disagree uh, with some of the things that, that, uh, jo that uh, Grudem talks about here. And again, he, he's a lot smarter than I am. He's made a whole lot of money off his book. And, uh, but I, I, do, I do disagree uh, with him uh, in that. So let's turn back to Genesis chapter 6. And I'll try not, get to, try not to get too bogged down uh, here in, in this. But this again, uh, you, may, you may have never even heard anybody even talk about this. We don't uh, spend much time whenever we're reading this. Uh, Brother Patterson or myself, we don't dig into this much whenever we're uh, teaching and preaching. But I, I am going to give you my thoughts on what I think uh, took place. And there have been volumes of ink that has been that has been um, spilled, I guess, as they would say, on what took place in Genesis chapter six. But let's look uh, there in verse one, and the Bible says there, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, the daughters were born unto them. The, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives all of which they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for he for that he also is flesh yet his days shall be 120 years. Now you notice something is taking place there. The Lord is saying, now, I'm not going to let these guys live for Methuselah 969 years. He's going to start cutting it down, and he's going to say, what we're going to do is we're going to put a limit on this thing. His days are going to be 120 years. And, and so some people say 120 years is a generation. Some people say Psalms talks about 70 years being a generation. Some people talk about 80 years being a generation. But you can be safe to say that somewhere a generation or a lifetime is somewhere between 70 and 120 years uh, that, that is in length. Okay, So uh, verse 4 uh, the Bible says there, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, and the same or the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So let's, let's just let's kind of unfold uh, this here. And we'll just kind of walk through now. Let's talk about this matter of sons of God. What were they? Who were they? Turn to Job chapter 1, and I want you to look in verse 6. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 6. The Bible says there, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now, let's, let's put something here that I, want this, that I think is important. God is omnipresent. That means that God is everywhere at the same time. Okay? He, he is, he's in Dothan, Alabama. 
He's with my brother-in-law and sister-in-law right now in Bucharest, Romania. Ever how many miles away that is? I think it's 8,000 maybe, something like that. It's a long way. It's not like here to Cottonwood, okay? And yet God is here and God is in Bucharest. God is also in Senegal with the Sullies. God right now is with Jonathan and Amanda Butler in Moldova. God is with Wayne Naylor in Danville, Kentucky. God is with Nate Royer in Sacramento, California. Here's the deal. The devil can only be in one place at one time. So, I think, I'm not going to say for you, but I'll say for myself, I probably have never seen the devil. However, I have got my head knocked around a little bit by some of his buck privates and some of his demons that he has that kind of, kind of follow me around. And some of them follow you around. Okay? So, this scripture right here tells us that Satan also came among these sons of God. Now, look at what else that verse 7 tells us. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. So that tells us right there, you got these sons of God, who I believe are, are spirits. And then you also have, there's another scripture and uh, in Genesis 1.26 where God says, let us make man in his image, or in our image rather. He, he's not talking to three different categories. And most people now, uh, most Trinitarians don't say, well, he's talking, they're talking among the Godhead. Okay, they, they've even shied away from that. So who is the Lord talking about? Let us or let's make, let us make man in our image. What's he talking about? He's talking about, he's talking to angels. He's talking to the Holy Council. Psalm 82, you can find where that it speaks of that, of that matter. And uh, there was another scripture that just came to mind and now it's totally gone. I'll try to pull it back at some point. Um, but what he's talking about there, oh, Psalm 8, uh, where it talks about man being made a little lower than the angels. Okay, y'all remember that in Psalm 8. Okay, so what, what's taking place here is you've got these, these spirits that are having to be responsible to God. Look at chapter 2, Job chapter 2, and look at verse 1. The Bible says there, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. Now, I want you to point out something. There's only three conversations in Scripture that the devil speaks. He speaks in Genesis 3. He speaks here in Job and then he speaks again in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. And Matthew 4, Luke 4 both cover the temptation of Jesus. Notice the content of the conversation. It always deals with the goodness of God. And here's where you start. In Genesis 3, what the, what the devil does is he manipulates the goodness of God. And he dangles it out in front of Eve and he says, look, Eve, if God was so good to you, he wouldn't have these prohibitions. He lets you just do whatever you wanted to do. But because God is not good to you. OK, that's the first. The second conversation is in the matter of Job. Now, here's what the devil does to Job. He accuses God. What does he accuse God of? He says, hey, you're too good to Job. 
If you take all this stuff away, I'm telling you now, he would curse you because you're too good. You've been too good to him. Fast forward, you get to the temptation in the wilderness. What's that about? Well, remember that term, son of man. The devil is making his appeal to the flesh. He's trying to get him to fall. He knows that God's not going to bow down to him. But if he can get the failure to come to the flesh. So what does he tell Jesus? You know what? You're good just like you are. All three of those conversations you'll find yourself in at some point in your life. You'll fall into the trap where he'll lie to you and say, well, God's not very good to you. If God was so good to you, you wouldn't be having all this trouble. If God was good to you, then you wouldn't be stuck right here having to live in these rules and regulations and you wouldn't be stuck in this place. That's what he tells us. All right. Another time he comes along, this is the part where that in Revelation, it talks about him being an accuser of the brethren. So we're kind of like in the, in the part where we're, we're kind of like a pawn. That's probably not the best term to use, but the devil is accusing God. You're being too good to those people. You, you're, you're too good to them. And then he'll catch us again in a similar matter like he called Eve. Now, the deal with Eve was, was he's telling her, God knows that, that he's not good to you because if he was really good to you, then you would be just like he is. Then he comes along in the temptation and he tells us, you know what? You're good just like you are. You don't need, you don't need God. Go ahead and create this and turn this into bread. Turn these stones into bread. Go ahead, accomplish and pursue these kingdoms. Go ahead and have your own religion. That's what he was doing whenever he takes him. He says, I want to put him at the pinnacle of the temple and tempts him to jump off. What's he trying to do? He's trying to make the flesh be something religious. Because if he can appeal to your flesh and make you appear to be religious, you don't have a need for a cross. You don't have a need to confess sin. You don't have a need to be baptized. You don't have a need to be walking in the spirit. So what the devil does and his demons, his demonic kingdom is doing is they're constantly blowing lies at us. Constantly. That, that's at the crux of it right there. All this stuff that you think, man, it's a temptation. It's, uh, um, you know, trying to get you to, to fall in some area. What is at the root of that temptation? Well, if you step back and look at it, what is he doing? He's lying to you. And if he can get you to fall to a lie, then that's what his actions and activities are. So, sons of God, Job 1 and 6, turn over. One more place in the book of Job and look at Job chapter 38 and look at verse 7. Job 38 and verse 7. And here's what he says. He says, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, there's a, there's a question there. Let me, um, let me kind of help you with a little bit of, of context there. Um, look, look at the beginning of verse 38. Now, here's a part. If you're wondering how long that the trial took place that Job was having to deal with. It was about a nine-month time frame. Okay? All the calamities that took place, all of this that was going on in his life was somewhere about a nine-month period. But look at <coughs> verse 38. 
Now, after Job has gone through all of his troubles, you know he has some buddies. Nadab, Elihu, Zophar. And then there's one other one, and I forget his name. Okay? Y'all know why? Y'all know Bill Dad was a very short guy. Did y'all know that? Why? Bill Dad, the shoe height. <laughs> okay, that's, that's your theological nugget for tonight, Brother Pierce. Okay, he was only, he was just this tall, Bill Dad, the shoe height. Okay, let me get off of that. All right, so all these guys talk to him. And they come at different angles. And then God's watched and observed all this. And then he starts in. Look at verse 38 and verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said. And he just starts asking questions. He asked questions in 38. He asked questions in 39. He asked questions in, in 40. He asked questions in 41. I think there's like 300 and almost 400 questions that God asked Job. All of those questions are rhetorical in nature. And when you start looking at the questions that God is asking Job, here's what you find out. These questions tell you how powerful and how awesome God is. And it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty potent stuff when you slow down and you kind of work through and, and just look at that. But in 38 and 7, again, we find this matter where he's talking about, uh, Job, where, where were you at when the morning stars sang together? Where, where were you uh, when all the sons of God shouted for joy? Well, Job hadn't even been, I mean, he hadn't even been thought of. And yet God's saying, hey, hey, Job, before you ever got to this place of trouble where you're at, I was already way out in front of you. And when you're gone, I'll be even on the other side. That's hard for us to grasp sometimes. Because we have a tendency to think, man, it all started with me and it's all going to end with me. And yet God was before and then God will be after. That's why you can put your trust and your confidence in, in him. It's interesting. It says when the morning stars sang together. Yes. And we read a reference of Lucifer called the morning stars. Yes. So apparently that is more than the morning. Yes. It's a whole bunch of yes. And the deal too is, is, is that I, I didn't stop long enough, but in Ezekiel, it talks about where the pipes and the tabrets, okay, the singing that took place. So that tells you right there that the devil, Lucifer, had something to do with the worship that was going on in heaven. I personally feel like that he started looking at all the worship that was directed toward God. And inside of him, he's like, hey, I, I want to get some of this turned around in my direction. And then that's what created uh, the matter of the fall. Okay, so these sons of God, they're identified elsewhere almost exclusively as angels. So keep that in mind. Genesis 6 sons of God, then we've cross-referenced it in other places that now these sons of God, they're angels. So what are we going to do with that? Well, the Bible says that they took wives of the human race. Then you keep looking at Genesis 6 and you're like, okay, not only did they take wives of the human race but they produced an unnatural union that violated the God ordained order of marriage and procreation that's in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24 so these beings these sons of God they come along and they violate and they end up with children now some interpreters want to say that these beings came from what is considered the sons of Seth and the sons of Seth cohabited with the daughters of Cain. 
Now you remember Cain killed Abel. God put a mark on him, cast him out. And he said, you're going to have to be a vagabond for the rest of your life. And there was a curse that was put on Cain. Cain, there were some daughters that came from Cain. Seth comes along and somewhat replaces Abel. So he's a good guy. His sons gets connected up with the daughters of Cain. That's one explanation. Now, I don't hold to that explanation because that would just be unequally yoked. So you're like, okay, why would God get so angry? Because God gets pretty angry. Okay, I don't know if y'all picked up on that, okay? But in Genesis 6, he tells Noah, build a boat, I'm going to flood this place. It repents me. I'm sorry I ever made this place. Okay, so God's pretty chapped. So you say, okay, well, if they're just unequally yoked, that same anger you would think would have prevailed throughout mankind's time. I mean, there's people get unequally yoked all the time. Despite sometimes the best advice in the world, you say, y'all not to marry him, y'all not to marry her, it's not going to be a good turnout, not going to be a good outcome. I think probably all of us in here that we know of a story or somewhere where there was a bad outcome uh, with that particular thing. So personally, I'm like, okay, I don't think that can fit sons of Seth or sons of God, sons of righteousness, marry the daughters of Cain. Okay? Now, others say, this is another interpretation, they say, well, it was some kings. And these kings came along, and what they were doing was they were pulling in these women because they wanted to populate their harems. Okay? Well, again, I don't feel like that that's a picture because... Why would God get so angry about that and want to, want to flood the world? Okay, so let's keep going. This passage places a strong emphasis on the angelic and human contrast. It's telling us angels, which I believe were fallen, they were, they were demons, sons of God, daughters of men. So, let's keep working. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 and 6, there's great wickedness on the earth. The intents and the thoughts of man was on evil. So, you got man going in this direction. They're very, very much focused in on evil. All right? So, uh, when you read that verse there, if you got, let's turn back and take a quick look at that. Genesis chapter 5, I mean chapter 6 and verses 5 and 6. I want to kind of stimulate your thinking uh, just a little bit. Um, look at 5. It said, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. I want to key in on that matter of every imagination and the thoughts of the heart. Do you remember Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12? You remember what it says about the word of God there? That it's sharper than any two-edged sword. What else does it say? Piercing asunder. What else? Dividing of the joint and marrow. And what else? The thoughts and the intents of the heart. So when you look and you realize, okay, in, in verse in verse five. The imagination and the thoughts of the heart are on evil continually. And so God is saying, my word is so powerful. 
that what it's going to do is it's going to work its way into the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Why? Because the Word of God is working toward conversion. That's the power of Scripture. Okay, so let's keep going. Now, the Lord says, I'm sorry that I made man, and it grieved him the direction that man goes in. Now, the New Testament places this account in sequence with other uh, Genesis uh, events, and it identifies it in the, in the matter that it involves fallen angels who indwelt man. So here's where I'm at. And I'm, again, I hadn't written any books about it. I'm just reading the Bible, reading some other theologians. So here's what my thoughts are. I believe that these people were demonically possessed because a spirit is not going to be able to cohabit with a human and create a being. We know the only one that, that can do that is when the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary. And that was a virgin birth. Okay? So the only other way that that can take place is for a demonic spirit to possess and now these fallen angels that are referred to as the sons of God cohabit with the daughters of men and whenever that union comes together and then there are children that are born out of that then that's where I believe I don't believe the matter of the Nephilim coming down and and having relations with you know a human and and uh, now there is some part where they like to play into that uh, you hear uh, the word incubus or succubus you may have heard those terms before okay that plays a lot into Hollywood and a lot of things like that it also brother Testa plays into a lot of Roman Catholicism so you was going to say something Jesus thought what, what, when Jesus was quizzed on Marriage in heaven. Yes. He definitely stated it. Yes. Do not yes. Procreate. Yes. So I, that is true, and I that's we, I don't know. We'll get to that tonight, but I do have the verse reference for that. That angels do not procreate. So how can an angel procreate? They got to have a body. So they possess individuals. Okay. Now, now you see where it's starting to get interesting. Was, to me, the whole deal is interesting. But you see now where we're starting to get in? And you're starting to like, how in the world can people say that the Bible is not interesting? It's because they don't spend time with it. Now, is anything that I've said here tonight crazy off the wall? Are y'all tracking okay with me? Okay. Any thoughts, ideas, questions? Nobody? All right, we've been going for an hour. Let's take a break.